And we are continuing our study in John 9, and I told you last week that I would be backing up to verse 31 to begin with, and that's what I uh, intend to do. John 9, 31 is a verse which, is an, which has often been used over the years by preachers, teachers, and members to talk about the fact of what the verse says. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And it has been used to say that if someone is not a Christian, that God does not hear their prayers. Now the response has been that, well, the person making this statement was not inspired, so uh, it's not valid. But is that the case? Notice what he says. He says, now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now, is that statement in essence made in the Old Testament? It is. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. I believe I've given you the right passage. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. He's talking to Israelites who were sinners, who were in sin. He says, I will not hear your prayers. Then you come over to Micah. Chapter 3, if I can get over there to it, it's not a passage that you turn to often, but it's one nevertheless, Micah chapter 3, verse 4, then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them, he will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. So Micah and Isaiah both speak of God not hearing prayers because of sin. God heareth not sinners is what this blind man whose eyes Jesus had opened says. I believe fully that what he's saying here is true because it's based in the Old Testament. And what's more, if this man was saying something that blatantly contradicted the law of Moses, the Pharisees would have jumped on it in a heartbeat. And they didn't. Because they recognized that what he said here was true. And they didn't contradict him. Now, what about the case of Cornelius in Acts 10? In Acts chapter 10, we have a man named Cornelius who is a centurion. He is a devout man. He gives alms to the people. He prayed to God always. And notice what the Bible says there in Acts 10 about uh, the response to his prayer. Notice, if I can get over to it once again, I'm getting, having a little bit of difficulty. Acts 10, 4. Uh, an angel of God came into him and said, Cornelius, verse 3, verse 4, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. So here's a man who is not a Christian. He is not a Jew. He is a Roman. Some, would, some have said he is a proselyte. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about that, whether he was a true proselyte or not. We know he was a God-fearer. At the very least... He was a man that stood in the same category as the, possibly those in the patriarchal age, even though we can't really be certain about it. Still, he was a devout man. He believed in God, and he prayed to God. And the angel told him, your prayers are come as a memorial. Now, did God answer his prayer in the sense that he granted him salvation? No. He had to send to Joppa for Simon, who would come and tell him words, according to Peter's testimony in Acts 11, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from sins. He had to hear the gospel preached. But God 
heard his prayer in the sense that he provided an opportunity for Cornelius to obey the gospel. Now, getting back to John 9, 31. We know that God heareth not sinners. We know that's true. If someone is in abject rebellion in the sight of God and he prays to God, God won't hear him. He won't answer his prayer. But, notice that qualifier. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. We know that's true, do we not? If someone does the will of God and someone is a worshiper of God, God hears, that is, answers that individual's prayer. So this man is telling the truth. This man is saying something which the scriptures uh, uh, back up. And he's not so saying something that we can't use. Now we need to be careful how we use this verse. Uh, because it has been used indiscriminately, I think, uh, in the past. Uh, we need to be careful and, and make sure that we point out the difference between the two categories of people he's talking about and uh, show how, from the New Testament especially, how that is the case. But just because this man's un uninspired doesn't mean he's not telling the truth. And he's not saying something that we can't follow, because he is. I mean, Mary herself... Uh, the mother of, of Jesus said something that I can follow he said to the servants whatever he says to you do it I can follow that even though she's not inspired of God yes could very well be the, the, uh, the question is would the word unbeliever be a better word I think that would be good uh, here if not sinners now sinners is a broad term um uh, yeah, we, we, if we are in sin, all of us are saved, saved sinners in a sense. We're Christians, but the difference is the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. Uh, if someone is outside of Christ and not a Christian, and that person prays to God, show me the way, uh, give me an answer, I'm looking, I'm searching, I firmly believe that God will provide he will provide an opportunity for that person to hear the truth. Now, that's in providence. That's something that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I can't completely explain providence. Brother Cecil May has done about the best job I've ever seen in print with his book by, on providence from the Gospel Advocate Company. And if you don't have a copy of it, you need to get it. It's an outstanding study. I think that God provides the means and opportunity for a person to obey the truth. But in the sense of God granting saving power to someone through prayer, no. Uh, the sinner's prayer is something which is absolutely unbiblical. It's unscriptural. It is nowhere found in the New Testament. And yet so many millions of people think that if you believe in God, repent and say this prayer, that you will be saved from your sins. Some, it, it, nothing could be farther from the truth than that. Obeying the gospel is the way that one is saved from their sins, the way the New Testament describes. Praying for salvation is simply something that you cannot find anywhere in the New Testament. But John 9.31 is something I think that we can use. We just got to be careful in uh, how we use it. So getting to the text itself, I believe we left off at verse 38 where this man it, it becomes a believer in Christ and he, that is this, this uh, blind man, worshipped him, worshipped Christ. And Jesus said, verse 39, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they, that they which see might be made blind. Jesus attracted those who were in need, and he rebel, repelled those who were self-satisfied, and, by the way, he still does that, does he not? Uh, those who truly are seeking will find him. And those who think they've got it made will not find him. Uh, I can give you example after example of famous individuals that think they've got it all figured out. They think they've got it all good. And nothing could be farther from the truth. 
Vincent Bugliosi was one of the most successful prosecutors when he went up against Charles Matson and the Matson family in 1969, 1970, 71. You remember all of that. Uh, documented in the book that he wrote, Helter Skelter. He only lost one case when he was prosecutor in Los Angeles. And yet, Vincent Bugliosi was a committed agnostic. He wrote a book not long before he died of cancer called Divinity of Doubt in which he claimed to criticize both atheism and, quote, Christianity, unquote. He spent more time criticizing Christianity than he did atheism. Uh, he thought he had the whole thing worked out in his mind. And if you ever saw Vincent Bugliosi interviewed on television, uh, you could get the impression that he thought of himself as the smartest guy in the room. That was his attitude. He had it all figured out, everything figured out in his mind. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. Christ repels those who are self-satisfied, those who think they have it made, those who think they can get along without any kind of outside guidance. They will not come to Christ. And Christ intentionally repels those individuals. Verse 40, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Are you talking about us? You know, there were, all of a sudden they think, hmm, you must be speaking about us. Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. In other words, you are responsible for your blindness. You're the ones responsible for it. So if you're blind, it's because of your own fault. Because you refuse to see is what he's telling them. In other words, you've got to make your own decision. You've got to come up with a decision whether or not you're going to truly see or whether you want to remain blind. Just like this man John that Jesus just healed. This man was willing to be healed and Jesus healed him. If he had not been willing to be healed, Jesus would not have healed him. And yet he did. Chapter 10, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The sheepfold. This is a roofless enclosure uh, of stone or uh, surrounded by thorn bushes, some kind of enclosure where the sheep was kept. And so he's talking about the fact that the shepherd is the one who is the shepherd of the sheep. Any other person that comes in through another way, some other way, is a thief. He steals by cunning. And he is a robber. Pharisees did both. Pharisees were thieves and robbers. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He's talking about himself, you see. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. This passage that we're looking at here is one of the most misinterpreted and misrepresented passages of any, or parables, that is, of any that Jesus spoke. And you're going to see why here in a moment. What Jesus is talking about is the fold. The fold is the church. The sheep are Jesus' disciples. Christ is the door, and he also is the shepherd, as we're going to see. But, as we're going to point out momentarily, uh, the denominational world takes this parable, and they twist it into ways that Jesus never intended. Let's continue. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Notice, the disciples, like these sheep, are led. If we are true disciples of Jesus, when we hear Jesus' voice, we will follow. When the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, they follow. That's what he's pointing out here. Now notice verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow, 
but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, in this context, the strangers that he's talking about are the Pharisees. In other words, the disciples will not follow the voice of the Pharisees. They will flee. They will follow the voice of the shepherd. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake to them. So, because it's a parable, they really don't completely understand what Jesus is pointing out. So verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. This is one of the I am statements of the Gospel of John. I am the door. The door of the sheep. So Jesus likens himself unto a door, or the door. He likens himself unto the light. I am the light of the world. In many other places, as we've already seen, he makes that qualifying statement, I am pointing back to Exodus chapter 3 where God tells Moses, I am that I am. Well, here's another one. I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There were many who had risen before Jesus and had claimed to be the Messiah. And there would be many after Jesus who would, well, would rise up and claim to be the Messiah. And yet all of them, Jesus says, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. He repeats this again. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus says, I am the door. Jesus is the door. He is the door to salvation. If any man enter in, enter into what? The fold. The fold being the church. He shall be saved. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That verse is one of the most encouraging verses that you could ever read. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, sheep, the, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all the, the, the devil and his minions are ever good for. That's all they ever do. But then Jesus tells why he came. I am come that they might have life. But not just life. He comes to bring spiritual life, yes. He comes to bring everlasting life, yes. But notice what he adds. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus promises his disciples a more abundant life. He wants us to enjoy living. Yes, we are in a sinful world. Absolutely, we're in a world of pain and sorrow and suffering. But Jesus wants us, as much as we possibly can, to enjoy life. That's what he wants us to do. There's going to be days where we can't smile. I understand that. There's going to be days where it's just sorrow, yes. But there are some days that you can allow yourself an occasional smile. And allow yourself an enjoyment of what this life has to offer. Whenever you're on vacation and you see some of God's creation, if you can't enjoy that, there's something wrong with you. Because the Lord placed those things in this world for us to enjoy. And he placed individuals, people in this world, for us to enjoy being in each other's company and to have fellowship with one another. There's so many things that we can enjoy about this life as children of God. And that's what Christ came to do. I am the good shepherd. There you go. Here's another I am statement, pointing back to the parable. He's not only the door, he's also the shepherd, but not just the shepherd, the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Here he's pointing toward his eventual sacrifice. Just like a good shepherd will do, he will give his life for his sheep to protect them, even so Jesus 
is do it, will do that for us. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Isn't that still true? Those who were not uh, the shepherd, those who were hirelings, those who love wages more than they love the flock, those who love the praise of men more than the praise of God, they care nothing for the protection of God's people. That would point to what Jesus would say in Matthew 7, what he did say in Matthew 7 about the false teachers. He said, beware of false teachers. Uh, prophets who come dressed in sheep's clothing but inwardly they're ravening wolves uh, this same kind of individuals Jesus is speaking of verse 13 the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine again he repeats I am the good shepherd as the Father knoweth me, even so lo I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father loves him, he loves the Father, he gives himself for the sheep. Now up to this point, everybody's just about in agreement in the religious world. It's beginning at verse 16 where we start seeing a large digression in religious thought. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I have heard this used by people outside of the church and even some of my own brethren to justify denominationalism. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. That means we can't criticize everybody out there in the religious world, the denominational world, because they are of the fold. That is, Jesus will bring them in. They will hear his voice. There will be one fold, one shepherd. All of us are brothers. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You just made my point. <laughs> He's talking about the Gentiles. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Specifically speaking of, of, of course, the Jews. But he's going to bring in the Gentiles into one fold. What is that fold? It's the church. So he's got to bring in, of course, the Jews first, and then other sheep I have which are not of this fold. He's going to bring in the Gentiles. That's what he's talking about in context, in immediate context. And to somehow interpret this as meaning that anybody who believes in Jesus, no matter what they've done to get saved, no matter what they practice in worship, no matter what they teach, everybody's going to be brought into one fold, no matter what. That's a complete misapplication of the passage. And yet I remember hearing a recording of a college professor many years ago, member of the church, that used this very verse in a keynote speech and made the point that the denominations are all okay. And it just completely blew my mind when I heard it. I'll tell you details if you want to hear them away from the microphone. Anyway, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. He's speaking, of course, now of his resurrection. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. This verse right here is a very important verse in understanding Jesus' mindset going into the crucifixion and the suffering that he would go through. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross. He, in fact, after a certain point, after the Mount of Transfiguration, the other Gospels tell us that his face was fixed, set toward Jerusalem. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to go through and suffer many things. 
of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. He knew he was going to do that. He was going to have that done. But he voluntarily went. Now, skipping forward a bit. When he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is in prayer to God three times, and he prays the, with, using the same words, sweat becoming as drops of blood, he says, uh, uh, if it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What is this cup? Let this cup pass from me. Some have said, well, he really dreaded being crucified. No. He didn't dread being crucified. He was bound and determined to be crucified. He says right here, I lay it down of myself. No man taketh it from me. In other words, Jesus was in control the entire time. What was he saying, though, when he said, let this cup pass from me? I firmly believe, because of what the Hebrews writer says, he was praying with strong crying and tears during that period in the garden, firmly believe that he was talking about the suffering, the extent of the suffering that he would endure. Let this cup, the pain, the agony, he knew what was coming. He prayed if it's possible. His human side was coming through completely at that point. Would anyone look forward to pain? Would anyone look forward to all of what Jesus went through as far as the pain aspect of it? No. Jesus was praying that if, the, if it possible, let this cup, the cup of pain, suffering pass. Nevertheless, he says, not my will but thine be done. He wasn't praying that he would be delivered from the cross. He wasn't being, praying that he would be delivered from the crucifixion. He was determined to see that through. He did that voluntarily. So that is a very important verse right here. Verse 18 of John 10. To understand the mindset of Jesus going in to the suffering or the, the crucifixion that he would go through. Verse 19. There was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? They're trying to explain away his miracles. Well, Satan's behind him. That's the constant refrain that you hear from these Pharisees. Oh, he's got a devil. And many of the uh, others said, these are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? They were going on the evidence. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication and it was winter. The Feast of the Dedication was an eight-day feast. Uh, it was uh, commemorating, of course, the renovation, the purification of the temple after it had been desecrated uh, by the Syrians under Antiochus IV Epiphanes during the intertestamental period. Jesus honored that uh, feast, that Feast of Dedication. It says it was winter. The time of the year was probably December, December 19th, 20th, thereabout. Uh, if you want to pinpoint the year, possibly 29 A.D., or maybe 28 or 27, uh, some variation on the time frame there. But it's in December of the year. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So he's in a very public place. He's a very public place. Within a year, by the way, the gospel would be preached in its fullness at Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, did they really want to know? No, they didn't. They wanted to use Jesus' words against them, against him. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. If they truly wanted to believe, they would have already confessed him because of his works. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You truly don't want to follow me, so you refuse to believe. My sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And so our religious neighbors say, you cannot fall from grace. Once you're saved, you're always saved. If you have it, you never lose it. If you lost it, you never had it. That's not what Jesus is pointing out here. This verse has been used quite often over the years by our religious neighbors to prove once saved, always saved. But you can't do it if your life depended on it. Notice, please. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Question, what if his sheep don't hear his voice? What if they don't follow him? Verse 28. They shall never perish, neither shall any man, any one, pluck them out of my hand. In other words, no one can take our salvation away from us against our will. That's the point here. No outside force can take this from you forcibly. There's going to come a time when the Pharisees and the scribes and those who are enemies of Christ will persecute the church and try to kill this new movement, the church. But yet they cannot take away your salvation from you. They can take your life, but they can't take away your salvation. No one can do that. But, verse 29, my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man or no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. But can we take ourselves out of the Father's hand? Yes, we can. Jesus tells the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 over and again with only two exceptions. He tells those brethren to repent. Repent of what? Repent of sin. And yet they're Christians. They're members of the church. They are in the body of Christ. And yet these congregations that have things that are wrong, Jesus tells them to repent. Further, Paul says in Galatians 5 to brethren in Galatia, the churches of Galatia, he tells them in Galatians chapter 5, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Question, how can you fall from something that you never had? And yet he said you are fallen from grace if you go by the old law. If the impossibility of apostasy doctrine is true, if it is the case that once you're saved, you're always saved, much of what the New Testament says is rendered gibberish, meaningless. What the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 is rendered meaningless. Notice, please, what Peter says in that very familiar passage of Scripture that we point out quite often in response to the once saved, always saved doctrine. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse within than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed were wallowing in the mire. Notice, please, what Peter says about these individuals. They have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They had known the way of righteousness. They had the holy commandment delivered unto them. Who is he describing? He's describing Christians. He's describing disciples of Jesus. And yet I had an individual tell me in a phone conversation that was arguing for an impossibility of apostasy. This was back in the mid-90s. He said that you can escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can know the way of righteousness, have the holy commandment delivered unto you, and not be a Christian. I said, am I hearing you correctly? You can escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not be a Christian? Yes. I said, explain how that happens. He said, it just happens. You're going to be so wedded to a doctrine that you're going to completely reject plain scriptural teaching? And yet that individual told me that, and I'm still trying to figure that one out. If you can figure that one out, let me know, because I'm having a problem trying to completely understand that. 
If you're so wedded to a doctrine that you're not willing to see the truth, it is a sad, sad thing indeed. Jesus is not talking about impossibility of apostasy. He's not teaching that. He's making the point that no one can forcibly take your salvation from you. No one can steal it from you. No one can snatch it from you. No one can do that against your will. That's the point. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Now, they want to kill him again based on what the old law says in Leviticus 24, 14 through 16. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? He's saying, My life proves my claim. Why are you wanting to kill me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. They wanted to judge his words apart from his deeds. His deeds proved his words to be true. No one could do the things that he did except he's from God. Nicodemus realized that. And yet it's more than just being from God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? He's quoting from Psalm 82.6. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? Now, what is he pointing out there in verse 34? Psalm 82, 6 is written to civil rulers who care little for God's law. He's not saying that they're gods in the sense that they are gods in heaven. He's talking about the authority that they possess. He calls them gods in that sense. So he says, since the scripture says that about human beings, and the scripture cannot be broken, how much more right does Jesus have to call himself the Son of God? How much more? He had the far better right. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe or understand that the Father is in me and I in him. He says, consider what I've done. Set aside my words. Consider my works. Consider what I've done. And then believe. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. Jesus' calm uh, presence possibly cooled them down to the point where uh, they wanted to arrest him and not stone him. Maybe he sort of calmed the fires a bit. At any rate, Jesus was able to escape whether it's miraculous escape, whether he was able to do it without using miraculous abilities, we are not really told by John. He simply was able to escape. And went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. And there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said,